This is QTV News. I am Amutu Gajaga and thanks for joining us. First, the main local, international and sports news headlines. President Adam Abaro declares all land and sea borders of the Gambia reopened and relaxed restrictions on casinos and nightclubs with immediate effect. Today, the Gambia joins the rest of the world to commemorate World Food Day. Stakeholders in the maritime sector on Friday launched the Gambia's Integrated Maritime Sector Strategy 2020 to 2030. The Minister of Information and Communication Infrastructure on Friday updated the media on activities of the various ministries and issues affecting the country. In international news, the two leading opposition candidates in the Ivory Coast October 31st presidential election on Thursday asked their supporters to boycott the election. And in sports, ahead of the West African Football Union Wafu Zone A Mains Under-20 Tournament in Senegal, the Under-20 coach of the Gambia has invited a provisional list of 32 players to start training. Those were the main news headlines. And now, the news in detail. Thank you for joining us and welcome. This is QTV News. President Barrow declares all land and sea borders of the Gambia reopened and relaxed restrictions on casinos and nightclubs with immediate effect. Alusise has the rest of that story. The president's decision follows what the statement says, encouraging reports by his cabinet subcommittee on COVID-19 and in consultation with the National Health Emergency Committee. On 19 May 2020, President Barrow closed the air, land and sea borders of the Gambia to protect citizens and residents from the devastating impact of the global coronavirus disease. However, due to ongoing reconstruction and modernization of the Banjul International Airport and consistent with stringent international aviation best practices, the Banjul International Airport is expected to resume full-scale operations by the 31st October 2020. Equally, based on the technical advice of the COVID-19 and National Health Emergency Committees and subject to the specific guidelines of the Public Health Dangerous Infectious Disease Protection Regulations 2020, President Barrow hereby relaxes the restrictions governing nightclubs and casinos throughout the Gambia. Reporting for QTV News, I am Aliou Sise. Today, the Gambia joins the rest of the world to commemorate World Food Day. The day is celebrated every year on the 16th of October in honor of the day of the founding father of the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, of the United Nations in 1945. This story was done by me, but narrated by Babu Kersise. The celebration falls on the 75th anniversary of the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO. It is estimated that 700 million people go to bed hungry every day. To mitigate this growing concern, especially at a time when the global pandemic has affected food security, a collaborated effort would be needed from key actors. We are aware of the bottleneck or challenges to end hunger as malnutrition continues to be a major public health problem with the most vulnerable groups being women and the children, the majority of whom live in the rural areas. In a country where agriculture contributes to more than half of its population's livelihood, Gambia has to invest a lot in human resources, capacity and equipment in order to grow enough food to feed its population to prevent hunger and malnutrition. In our celebrations of World Food Day, we must remember to help the most vulnerable within our community. At the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, our council has responded to the needs of the most vulnerable by cutting our travel budget and providing food relief packages to the most vulnerable households in KMC's 19 wards. I believe this principle of supporting the most vulnerable is at the heart of the international community's recent acknowledgement of the World Food Program's critical service to humanity by awarding WFP with the Nobel Peace Prize. Part of UN's Sustainable Development Goals is ending hunger by 2030. In just 10 years, is this realistic? Well, not that only enough food needs to be produced, but its distribution, security and sustainability should be guaranteed. WFP has unparalleled experience in buying and distributing food Every year, WFP increases the amount of food it procures locally from the smallholder farmers, providing training in post-harvest storage and in how to access markets. The aim is to build dynamic food systems which contribute to the community-based agricultural growth 
and the strengthening of national economies. Hunger and malnutrition affects the vulnerable groups such as women and children most, especially during crisis. Several countries in the continent, including the Gambia, were affected by flash floods due to torrential rains destroying food and food crops. Small-scale farmers often lack the machinery to produce enough food for themselves and the greater population. Eating what you grow is more important than importing food. Sometimes the bags of rice we buy contain some small stones, which could harm you when you eat it. Therefore, your own food is a perfect fit for consumption. Stakeholders in the maritime sector on Friday launched the Gambia's Integrated Maritime Sector Strategy 2020 to 2030. As Aliusisi reports, the strategy seeks, among other things, to ensure the protection and optimal use of the maritime resources. The 10 year maritime strategy is a 20 page policy document that officials say has the objectives to better improve the maritime sector through participatory approach and to ensure a safe and secure maritime among others. The document was validated in February this year after a series of engagements among stakeholders. Karamo Jane, Director General of the Gambia Maritime Agency, is optimistic that all concerned institutions will cooperate to achieve the desired goals of the strategy. It is now time for implementation, which will give meaning to all the efforts and time spent on the finalization of the document. We have crossed the first stage of this process. Now it is the bigger task of putting the words in this document into action that is remaining. I am optimistic and hopeful that all the concerned institutions will collaborate and cooperate in the implementation of this strategy document for the realization of our collective goals and aspirations in the maritime sector. The Gambia maritime sector is critical to the socio-economic development of the country based on efficient management and good governance. Mamadou Salim Musa is the chairman of the board of directors of the Gambia Maritime Administration. The validation was successful thanks to your hard work and dedication to such an important national document. GEMIS is intended to ensure better management of the maritime environment, promote maritime safety and security, while exploring new frontiers for sustainable exploitation of our marine resources for collective economic well-being. The final policy document has strategic objectives that border on five thematic areas of maritime governance, safety and security, environmental protection, economy and research, as well as awareness. These strategies, strategic objectives are highly interconnected, spanning beyond the mandate of any one institution. The Gambia has a coastline of about 80 kilometers and is confronted with growing and emerging challenges to its maritime domain. Mot Kesise, permanent secretary at the Ministry of Transport, commended the stakeholders who have made it possible to produce the document. I congratulate the government of the Gambia for launching today the GMIST and thereby fulfilling a key IMO and national development plan requirement. Gambia is a maritime nation and you don't need to go far to confirm this. This is not far-fetched. Uh, this report is not for GME or Motwi alone. Um, it's a reference document uh, for the sector. Uh, be the operators, regulators, environmentalists, security, FISA folks, just to name a few. The Gambia is a signatory to many international maritime conventions and regional treaties many of which encourage and require countries to have a maritime strategy. In fact, the AU's Africa Maritime Transport Charter requires AU member countries to implement the provision of the Africa Integrated Maritime Strategy 2050. This launch strategy document is therefore a reflection of the Gambia's future aspirations in line with the continental strategy. Reporting for QTV News, I am Alou Sise. The Minister of Information, Communication and Infrastructure on Friday held the 11th Inter-Ministerial Press Conference to update the media on the activities of the various ministries and issues affecting the country. Omar P. Jallo has more. The Minister for Information and Communication Infrastructure, Ibrahim Asilla, informed journalists that at the start of the rainy season, 
the Ministry of Agriculture through the National Seed Secretariat distributed 310 metric tons of rice seeds, 132 metric tons of groundnut, 36 metric tons of maize, 9 metric tons of cowpea, 518 kilograms of findi. Minister Silla reveals that the Department of Water Resources is implementing two projects aimed at providing quality drinking water to the rural populace. These projects include the Climate Smart Rural Wars Development Project funded by the African Development Bank to the tune of 40 million US dollars. It will provide 144 solar-powered water supply system to 276 communities in five administrative regions of the country. The fishery sector, as part of its objectives, to rationally generate revenue for the state in the form of both local and foreign currencies, has from 2017 to date generated a total revenue of 316 million. $915,484.26 Bututs. The sources of revenue, according to the Ministry of Fisheries, Water Resources and National Assembly matters, include 10% fish landings of vessels that could not land catches in Banjul due to landing facilities constraints, including landing and jetty facilities, fishing license fees imposed on arrested fishing vessels, and partnership agreements, notably the EU Sustainable Partnership Agreement and Senegalo Gambia Fishing Agreement. On the health sector, Minister Silla says the World Bank Board of Executive Directors have approved a $30 million grant from the International Development Association to improve the quality and utilization of essential health services in the Gambia. The project includes the renovation of selected health facilities and the establishment of a national blood transfusion service. The project is also expected to help reduce maternal and child mortality, therefore contributing to the improvement of the Gambian's Human Capital Index. He announces that the Ministry of Trade is developing the National Regional Integration Policy and Strategy to pave a clear direction for the Gambia in harnessing the much-needed benefits for her membership in the regional and sub-regional organizations. The Gambia Tourism and Hospitality Institute, under the Ministry of Tourism and Culture, is said to be on the verge of constructing the first ever pastry and bread production center at the GTHI main campus in Carnifing. On the underperformance of students in mathematics in this year's GABES results, Minister Silla said it is not only peculiar to the Gambia but across the West African Examination Council member states. However, for the first time, six candidates scored A1 in all their nine subjects. Reporting for QTV News, I am Omar P. Jallo. The United Nations Systems in the Gambia, in partnership with the Gambia government, the National Youth Council, and the Gambia Association of Local Government Authorities, held a day-long regional consultation exercise on Friday on the UN Common Country Assessment. Antoine Sonyasi has more on this report. Held under the theme, Shaping Our Future Together, this initiative creates an avenue for young people, government, local authorities, and the UN to take stock of national and global achievements, as well as discuss the way forward in celebrating the 75th anniversary of the UN's founding. Addressing participants, I sat a day, UN Resident Coordinator, and Kunle Adenie, UNFP Resident Representative, underscored the importance of this exercise. With the UN Development Assistance Framework expected to end in 2021, they look forward to engaging more young people through various development projects and programs, especially in the subsequent transitioning of the UN system in the Gambia to the next generation of the UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework. The fact that we are in a moment where we are celebrating these 75 years, but engaging in the last decade of the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, that as Kunde rightly said, are the goals that have been determined by the United Nations, by us, because these goals are not for the government to achieve or for a specific entity to achieve, but it's for all members of the United Nations, of the people of the United Nations, to contribute to the achievement of the goals. The peculiarities of Gambia that can actually accelerate the development of the Gambia towards 2030, which is another yardstick and benchmark of the development goals. So the CCA process and the UN 75 process are like two-in-one approaches. 
And the idea is that we can effectively dialogue to see how we better design and you know, respond to the needs of the people of the Gambia. On behalf of the local government authorities, the president of Galga, Landing Sane, thanked the UN system in the country and the National Youth Council for creating an opening for extensive stakeholder engagement. He says similar consultation activities have been held in various regions across the country. A um, series of engagements and we had some very good ideas coming out. And I think in KM as well, it will not be anything different. We will have the participation of all the stakeholders present here to give us uh, probably to participate in the discussions as to what um, UN means to us and what we, we see, want to see. Other speakers included the CEO of KMC, Senabu Martin Sonko, and Musa Bah, Deputy Mayor of KMC. The consultation exercise was facilitated by officials of the UN and the National Youth Council. Antoine Esoyasi for KTV News. We will go for a short commercial break, and when we come back, the news continues with some more local news stories. Do stay tuned. Welcome back and thanks for joining us. This is QTV News. Following the reopening of schools amidst the coronavirus pandemic, our reporter in the URR visited schools in Basse to find out their preparation for the new academic year after more than six months of closure. This story by Fode Mane is narrated by Elijah A.F. Jalo. Schools across the country were closed due to coronavirus pandemic. On the first day of opening, children were excited not only to begin learning, to make up for lost hours, but also to reunite with friends and classmates after a long break. At the Nasir Sino Secondary School, the Vice Principal Abraham Dakwa said, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the entire educational system in the country. He added that there are inadequate facilities and demand for human resources for schools to start proper learning. Actually, it has disturbed the, the, the whole educational system. And, uh, Last academic year, we were able to complete almost two terms, remaining a whole term, you know, program to be conducted. But however, we were able to adjust. The government also put a hand together and uh, we were able to adjust for the grade nine to complete their final examination as well as the senior school grade 12 and now we are waiting for the result it also has created a demand for human resources example teachers so the school need to engage more teachers just to you know keep the program going because the morning Grade 9, I mean grade 11 and 12 alone, 22 classes. Grade 8 and 9 alone, 22 classes. Grade 7 and 10 also will be the same number, 22 classes. So it means the school needs more infrastructure, you know, facilities, able to harbor all these things. The principal of Koba Kunda Upper Basic School, Kadi Bojan, expressed delight for the reopening of schools. We are very happy because you can see that the excitement on the students in the morning was quite very good. The students were very happy to come back to the school and like, unlike, likewise the, the heads and the teachers were also very happy to come back to the school. Despite health experts' advice on social distancing and other preventive measures, the head girl on Nasir Senior Secondary School, Aisha Tujalo, said it is difficult and not affordable for many vulnerable children. 
She urges her colleagues to be committed and dedicated to their lessons as school resumes. Since school closed, other parents are there. They create tough time for the students. They will not have time to read their books. As we all know, when school resumes, students be dedicated and let them know that the, the time that we lost, we should be, be able to minimize or to utilize the time that we have for this year. As the coronavirus remains with its challenges, it is hoped that both teachers, students and parents will work together to help prevent the further spread of the disease. For QTV News, I am Alaji A.F. Jalo. A former lab technician chosen to monitor the former President Jami's HIV and AIDS treatment program by testing blood samples says Jami was not happy when HIV test results turned positive after his so-called cure. Babu Karsi has the rest of that story. Testifying via a video link, Abdullah Bachili told the Truth Commission that he was chosen to test blood samples which are brought to him by Dr. Mbou and Dr. Njai. The witness said after conducting a test on the four samples, all turned out positive and ex-president Jame was not happy. Bachili said he was then invited to state house by Yaya Jame and asked to collect the samples himself, which he did. When the results turned out positive again, the witness said the president was not happy. He was disappointed, he was angry was that, that the test results still show HIV positive. Yes. 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 That is your testimony. Yes. He was disappointed that this test results still show HIV positive. That's your testimony. If they were all okay as expected, I don't think that would have been actually. But she said he suggested to Jame to take the blood samples to MRC, but Jame warned that if the MRC comes close to his patients, he will shut down the research center. Bachili said he then suggested to the president for the samples to be taken to Senegal for the test to be conducted. And the results were put in a sealed envelope and handed over to Dr. Mbou. According to Bachili, some of the test results came out undetectable and that prompted Jame and Dr. Mbou to announce that Jame is curing HIV and AIDS. Uh, and and it's it's not, not, not really Senegal, Senegal, but, 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 uh, Who was right on this occasion? Uh, was it the protesters or was it uh, the claimers of having discovered a cure in Vanjul? Who was right? The claim to have a cure for HIV AIDS was a lie. You agree? Was not true. Was a lie. Abdullah Bachili said he continued to live with depression, stress and anger as he felt betrayed and disappointed by Jame and Dr. Mbou for interpreting the results he brought from Senegal differently. Bachili said he finally decided to leave the country to settle in the United Kingdom. Babu Karsi, QTV News. We will take another short commercial break and we will continue with the news with international and sports news when we return. Welcome back. And now to international news. The two leading opposition candidates in the Ivory Coast October 31st presidential election on Thursday asked their supporters to boycott the election as the nation officially began its 2020 presidential campaign. This story by Marie Louise N. Sanyang is narrated by Ansumane Soinyasi. After taking to the streets to protest against Ouattara's bid for a third term in the upcoming presidential elections, the opposition candidates ask their supporters to boycott the elections. Four candidates are contesting for the upcoming elections. President Ouattara, age 78, Betty, 86, Afi N. Gushan, and former parliamentarian Quado Bertin. Demonstrations against Ouattara's decision to run again have turned violent and left around 15 people dead. Several high-profile figures, including Conan Betty and former Prime Minister Afi N. Gushan, have called for civil disobedience in recent weeks. During the campaign, Ouattara is expected to point to his excellent record 
on the economy and the positioning of Ivory Coast as the world's biggest exporter of cocoa due to its regional powerhouse. He also promises a better distribution of growth to the country's poorest and most remote areas. The former foreign minister, Marshall Amontano, said this election will not be credible. The turnout among the 7.5 million people entitled to vote in a country with a total population of 25 million will be a key point. Observers fear a high abstention rate in a country with a median age of 18.7 for an election in which the two main contenders have been on the political scene for 30 years. Last month, the international crisis group called for a postponement and suggested political exiles be allowed to return to Ivory Coast. Last week, a delegation of African and UN envoys expressed deep concern ahead of the vote. The boycott means Ouattara's only opposition is independent candidate Kwajo Conan Bertin. Antoine Soignasi for QTV News. And now on to Spum Sports News. Ahead of the West African Football Union Wafu Zone A Men's Under-20 Tournament in Senegal, Matar Mboj, the Under-20 coach of the Gambia, has invited a provisional list of 32 players to start training at the National Technical Training Centre in Yundum. This story by Elijah Emma Cham is narrated by Aliou Sise. The West Africa Football Union Wafu Zone A Men's Under-20 Tournament will be hosted by Senegal from Friday 6 to Sunday 15 November 2020. The last tournament played in Guinea, the Gambian under 20 won the bronze medal, while in 2018 in Liberia, they emerged as champions. Coach Matar Mboch wants to give each of the invited players the chance to have the opportunity to play for the under 20 national team. He normally would select about 25 players because at the end, only 20 players will travel for the tournament. To try to make the selection process, the recruitment process, if you like, as wide as possible. Um, for us, the, uh, we're constrained in terms of time, so we wanted to try to make sure that we have a very good number of players who can come together and for us to quickly make an assessment of them in terms of physically, technically, tactically, um, and try to get them up to speed as well. Usually, 32 is a number that I, I, I don't work with. It's usually around the 25, 24 mark, because in this final squad you have 20 players. But because there's been so much time without any activities, um, it's difficult to reference the performances of players back in March. You want to give them a fair chance to see what they're like now. Coach Moch has been following some of these players since their school days and is happy they are playing in the National League. But for us, you know, it's not just on what we've seen last season. Some of these players, we've seen them for the past four years, five years, some of them. Um, I've been aware of them since they've been playing school football and I'm happy that they've graduated and they're playing first team football in the first division. In the His technical staff, he says, is open to other players who are not in the provisional selection. As, as wide as we can. It's never perfect, believe you me. I'm not going to sit here and say that oh, I've got the 30 and it's perfect. There is still time for other players who are potentially not on this list to make their way in if we see their performances are good in their training clubs, if in these pieces and tournaments coming up as well. Likewise, if any player doesn't pull their weight, doesn't have the quality they were looking for to go to a tournament, then they're going to be released and replaced by somebody else. Like any other coach, it was very difficult for him to come up with this selection. He clarified that the players eligible for the tournament are those born on or after 2001. Thank you for the support so far. Long may it continue. Reporting for QTV News, I am Alou Sise. Before we end this bulletin of the news, let's have a quick look at our main news stories. President Barrow declares all land and sea borders of the Gambia reopened and relaxed restrictions on casinos and nightclubs with immediate effect. Today, the Gambia joins the rest of the world to commemorate World Food Day. Celebrated every year on the 16th of October in honor of the date of the founding of the FAO of the United Nations in 1945. Stakeholders in the maritime sector on Friday launched the Gambia's Integrated Maritime Sector Strategy 2020-2030. The Minister of Information and Communication Infrastructure on Friday updated the media on the various activities of the ministries and issues affecting the country. In international news, the two leading opposition candidates in the Ivory Coast October 31st presidential election on Thursday asked their supporters to boycott the election. And in sports, ahead of the West African Football Union Wafu Zone A men's under-20 tournament in Senegal, the under-20 coach of the Gambia has invited a provisional 20 or 32 
players to start the training. That's all we have for you in this edition of the news. Thank you very much for watching and join us tomorrow for more news.